Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back to PMFIS Current Affair Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik, and this is your second part of the test number four. And we are going to discuss the next twenty questions of our test. I really hope that you have enjoyed the very first part, and I'm sure you have got to learn a lot of things about the test series. But here is a special announcement for every UPSC aspirant out there. If you are eagerly waiting for one particular test series which is high on quality but low on your budget. then do check out our entire test series it is available at just rupees 499 with 1000 very high quality mcqs the link is given in the description below so do check it out so that you can get the real experience of the upsc exam so the question number 21 which was asked in your um, exam was with respect to the zero fir so Uh, uh, of course you are supposed to be little bit aware of the normal procedures of the fir for this particular um, question now what exactly normal fir we know but what exactly is this zero fir that we need to figure out so if you look at the details of the question normally um, as per the criminal code of criminal procedure crpc section 154 it deals with the normal fir which stands for first information report you know that fir is the information about the cognizable offenses that a person has to report uh, to the police cognizable offenses are those particular offenses where the arrest can be done even without warrant so for all the uh, all such kind of offenses where arrest can be uh, done without your warrant for all those kind of offenses fir is mandatory it is mandatory uh, you you have to file if the offense is of non cognizable category then f no fir can be launched so please remember exclusively fir is exclusively related to the cognizable offenses only now in the case of non cognizable offenses normally we what we register is non cognizable report called the ncr so ncr for this category and fir for the cognizable one normally <clears throat> but what this zero fir means the word zero fir actually signifies that fir can be launched by in any police station irrespective of any territorial jurisdiction of the police station normally what happens you are supposed to register your fir in that in that particular area where the crime has taken place there is the like every uh, police station has a juris jurisdictional uh, area no so within that jurisdiction of the police station then only uh, they are going to lodge a complaint if the crime has happened within their jurisdiction zero fir is something where you can go to any police station irrespective of territorial jurisdiction and the police is supposed to file your fir this is called zero fir which is not uh, dependent on territorial jurisdiction number 1 number 2 such firs are very important why because because then if you have lodged your fir in any police station that fir is going to transfer to the police station of the concerned territorial jurisdiction and in that particular case after that uh, concerned police station receives the zero fir the relevant police station is supposed to register a fresh fir and it has to start the investigation so this process was made so that the reporting of the cases can be increased and without any much hustle without any trouble the firs can be lodged and the appropriate actions could be taken now in this particular case both statements are absolutely correct the word zero fir probably it 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 is a bit confusing word if you have not heard about it the probably the question was i think the question was a bit a uh, bit a bit tough one but still understanding the uh, two statements you can still figure out that probably this is the closest thing you can think of about the zero fir this question could have been risked if you have little bit idea but otherwise something you you can skip because uh, the topic is not very common and something that you have to be really aware about the uh, question number 22 was with respect to global hunger index published by which of the following now the only key here is the word hunger i'm talking about the hunger index so my only savior here is this particular ngo called wealth hunger life i mean that is the only thing that can help me out otherwise uh, it is difficult to figure out these kind of questions because they are like 
pure factual questions and this is i am repeating it so many times whenever you read about any index whenever you read about any report while preparing your current affairs the very first thing you have to focus is who or which particular authority is publishing it releasing it that is the first thing of your concern in global hunger index it is the it is there are two ngos one is concern worldwide it is an irish ngo and then we have the wealth hunger life it's a german ngo so these two ngos uh, published this report why it was in news now overall if you see this question was an easy one it was a very direct one and could have been attempted very easily now why this was in news because india has got a very poor ranking on the global hunger report india was ranked 111 out of 125 where this report clearly says that india is right now having a severe level of hunger issue in fact with a score of just 28.7 india's hunger level is serious and even worse than our neighboring countries pakistan bangladesh nepal sri lanka even they have better rankings in terms of hunger report okay and this is an annual report which is released by these two ngos overall if, if you look at the uh, global hunger index now there are the, the score is from 0 to 100 where uh, 0 means the the better score and 100 means like uh, sorry 0 is the worst score i mean 0 is uh, something which is having the maximum level of hunger and uh, 100 score means you have the minimum level of hunger if you compare this with the ireland look at the ireland ireland has a score iceland sorry i have read it somewhere iceland has a score of around 94 something look at the level of development in that particular area iceland having 94 best performing in terms of uh, in terms of the global hunger this particular index now let me be uh, let me tell you in i think it was in 2015 previous year questions 2015 or 16 i think it was 15 uh, there was a question that was being asked on the global hunger index and it was it was asked about the indicators so overall this entire index is based on uh four you can say as parameter with three major pillars three major index uh, three major indicators one is inadequate food supply child mortality and within child nutrition it is it is uh, considering wasting and stunting so these are the four particular things on which the entire index is based how much is the under 5 mortality rate how much is the under nourishment and what is the level of wasting and stunting these four are the parameters on which the entire score is based so of course with india's serious level of hunger the things are not really good and something we have to be very uh, very uh, we should be worried about actually no next question is with respect to the particularly vulnerable tribal groups called the pvtgs i think this is one of the most common topic that you you have come across when whenever you prepare about the tribal populations of india pvtg is the most common thing that you have heard of okay now i'm not going into the detail let's 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 uh, und- let's understand it in a very layman language pvtg is as the name says particularly vulnerable tribal group it is first statement says that they are more vulnerable among the tribal group of course the name itself says they are particularly vulnerable right at present there are 75 pvtg is very common fact i think everyone knows about it but there is problem with the second statement and the statement number 4 we are very well aware that it is the it is odisha having the highest number of pvtgs not the jharkhand and rohini commission it was in news very recently rohini commission has relation to the sub categorization of the uh, of the of the castes like we have the we have the uh, obc caste right we have the we have the sc caste this particular commission talks about the sub categorization of already these caste reservations the sub categorization so that grassroots level people of these caste are also going to get the benefits of the reservation and like that right so rohini commission has nothing to do with the pvtgs so 1 and 3 are correct so answer is only 2 in my opinion this question was an easy one because it is very very common in the news and nothing with any without any problem you could have attempted it easily talking a little bit more about the pvtg initially they used to be called as primitive tribal group but right now the name is 
particularly vulnerable tribal groups understand it with this venn diagram so this is the total tribal population of india within the entire tribal population we have some some tribes known as scheduled tribes but then we have this one particular category of the tribes which is called pvtg particularly vulnerable tribal group it was dhebar commission it was the dhebar commission that have actually initiated the process that recommended that the government is supposed to create a primitive tribal groups called the ptgs initial name was ptgs uh, and this dhebar commission is also known by another name called tribal panchil committee so very very careful you may have a question not by dhebar but they may ask you question about the tribal panchil committee so you don't have to get confused it is still the dhebar commission and um, these particularly uh, these primitive tribal groups was formed 1975 later on it was 2006 when the name was changed from ptg to the pvtgs talking about their dis, uh, their um, overall distribution so yes there are total 75 tribes which are included as pvtg and um, they are spread across uh, you know 18 states and the uts of india odisha having the largest number of pvtgs followed by mp and andhra when i say andhra's pvtg it also include the pvtgs of Talang telangana because we are talking about the undivided andhra before 2014 in odisha there is a community called as saura community that is having the largest pvtgs where the number is approximately 5 lakh 35000 approximately it's a huge population right so yeah it is uh, uh, odisha having the absolute number of pvtgs uh, at the maximum level another question 24 is uh, also with respect to pvtgs now you have got a bit a little bit of idea that they are very vulnerable population right and you are given four criteria just read about them and read them very normally and you will understand why any particular group can become vulnerable simply by logic think about everything worst that is possible what can make any tribal group vulnerable think about it pre agricultural lifestyle yes because if it is a pre agricultural lifestyle you are going to have maximum people depending on hunting and gathering right or even if they are doing little bit of agriculture it's going to be very local based low level of literacy yes can make tribal group vulnerable subsistence economies they are still producing feeding for themselves have nothing they have nothing else to do and a very small stagnant population yes so all these factors logically convince me that all of them somehow contribute to the vulnerable vulnerability of the tribal population right so criteria all the four criteria are absolutely correct easy question could have been attempted by simply understanding the meaning of vulnerability and trying to understand it from the options point of view so right now we know that uh, all these factors are considered while categorizing any tribe as a pvtg right it is important as far as population size is concerned yes the population is a big problem i mean there are so many tribal groups in india where the population is even less than 1000 i mean look at the great andamani uh, andamanis this particular tribal group has just 50 number of individuals living right now and the onge is like only 100 individuals are there right so yeah we have these kind of problems um uh you know when it comes to pvtgs question number 25 again with respect to scheduled tribe now this is not pvtg careful this is about the normal scheduled tribes of india the very first statement says i am not going into the detail just apply your normal common sense of polity first statement says in consultation with the chief minister of the state president can identify any group as a scheduled tribe group for a state have you ever heard president like interacting or consulting with the chief ministers in 99% cases you have read that president govern a state through governors the governors are more of the representative elements from the central government right so president always going to consult with the governor not with the chief minister i mean we have not read this as a common trend and when it comes to selecting or identifying any group as a scheduled tribe it is always governor who is going to get consulted not the chief minister so this looks very awkward to me and that's why this statement looks wrong and second statement says the parliament can modify 
the laws or can make the laws to modify the list of scheduled tribe yeah of course i mean uh, talking about the scheduled tribes the parliament is the right authority that is going to modify the list of the scheduled tribes so my answer is supposed to be b simply by understanding and applying my knowledge of polity i could have figured out it very easily talking about the details little bit more you know that in indian constitution article 366 it is specifically prescribed that the scheduled tribes means those particular tribe or tribal communities which are included or deemed under the article 342 of indian constitution whatever tribe whatever community is included under 342 becomes scheduled tribe of our country and it also says very clearly it says article 342 sub part 1 says the president is going to consult the governor for that particular matter of including and recognizing identifying any group as a scheduled tribe group right and yes it is the parliament has the right to include or exclude any group from the st list it is it is purely the decision of schedule, uh, of our parliament so answer question is very simple could have been easily done next question you are given certain conditions and you are being asked that which of these circumstances abortion can be performed in india you know that in india abortions are legal but abortions come with certain conditions for that matter we have got the the medical termination of uh, uh, pregnancy bill there was a 1971 bill recently being replaced amended by 2021 bill so this question make a lot of sense it makes lot of relevance why that is why the question is being asked but forget about the uh, technicalities just think about the circumstances under which abortions su is supposed to be legal supposed to be mandatory right think about it continuing the pregnancy would risk the women's life and physical mental health of course if that is the case abortion is going to be allowed right if any there is high high risk of child being born with some serious physical mental disability then there is there is a there is a medical case where abortion should be performed because uh, you know giving birth to a child having these uh, complications are not not something that we want right similarly the if the pregnancy results from the contraceptive failure or even in the case of rape because it 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 ultimately injures a women's mental health so in that case also logically the abortion should be allowed well in this case yes all the three are correct very easy something you could have normally understood as a as a logical indian logical uh, citizen you can think about under which circumstances abortion should be allowed so talking little bit more about the legal provisions so very important this committee is important guys you will have another question coming on this committee uh, in in um, in the questions ahead so there was a committee called shanti lal shah committee on the re report and recommendations of this committee 1971 medical termination of pregnancy act was passed and this was the law that legalized abortion in india of course not like doing it for any reason under some circumstances circumstances and all these statements are classified all the statements are correct because they are uh, they are covered under those circumstances now recently you see the uh, this medical termination of pregnancy amendment act was passed by the government in 2021 and this was very much in news and do expect one mcq from this as well because recently now under the normal conditions under the 1971 act the abortion was legalized or was allowed till the first 20 weeks of pregnancy but in this 2021 bill there is increase in the upper gestation limit and now from 20 the abortion can be done till 24 weeks of pregnancy first 24 weeks of pregnancy and that was allowed for some special categories of women some special categories included those victims of rape those uh, having some uh, having some mental disabilities like these kind of uh, situations were added now very interestingly and very importantly there is no upper gestation limit i mean there is no 24 week limit if the case is having substantial fetal abnormalities and that is diagnosed by medical board so even after 24 weeks the abortion can be done of course it ha it has specified 
that one medical practitioner opinion will be needed up to 20 weeks of pregnancy if that is the case or to be abortion but if you are going to have abortion within 20-24 weeks then there's a requirement of at least two medical officers medical practitioners they should be given uh, in writing and then only the abortion can be done so these are very interesting and important points important changes i would say under the particular act that, like something you have to be aware of even even the unmarried women can also go and terminate their pregnancies of course under the supervision and provisions of this particular act but for that matter if there is a case of minor then consent of the guardian is required so be very aware that in india even unmarried women can opt for the uh, abortion that is legal under the particular act question number 27 was with respect to the national mission on edible oils palm oil okay now this question can again be solved with a little bit of common sense little bit of knowledge your overall awareness and presence of mind i'm talking about mission on edible oils oil palm right how it can be a central sector scheme because it includes the element of agriculture since it include the element of agriculture the state participation becomes very important so this scheme is not central sector scheme this is simply a central sponsored scheme where funding is to be done by state as well it has agriculture in it right first statement wrong the second statement says the objective of this scheme is enhancing the edible oil production by palm oil area expansion productivity increase look at the name of the uh, program it itself says it's a mission on edible oil oil palms so what mission can do of course we are talking about increasing the productivity increasing the availability of edible oils right so this statement looks very logical and it goes very well along with the uh, nature of the mission third statement is wrong it says this particular mission i'm talking about the edible oil palm oil specifically guys if you have to grow palm oil of course you have to grow specific trees for that do you think that such kind of these are very specific consider considering the agroclimatic conditions of the palm oil do you think that these kind of programs can be implemented in all the state and UTs because every state all state think about Jammu Kashmir can you think Jammu Kashmir having oil palms no of course not so these are very specific there is specific uh, agroclimatic condition required and given those specific agroclimatic conditions right it is not going to be implemented on all over India it is going to be in some specific states only so logically third statement also looks wrong for me think about because any there is no particular uh, crop there is no particular tree which is favorable for entire India given the diversity of the climate in India it is not possible to have a pan India kind of program right even four statement is wrong have you ever heard oil palm in the states in the states like Gujarat and Maharashtra you know because palm oil require requires more of a more of a typical tropical climate it requires more of a closer to equatorial climate right near or at least it requires a near, near equatorial kind of climate so oil palms are mainly restricted in the southern parts of the India of, of the country Maharashtra uh, and Gujarat are not probably the best states to grow these oil palms so simply using my little bit of knowledge I could have got the right answer as only one the statement I would say tough but something you could have attempted by normally eliminating and checking each statement individually right so yes now you have the details in front of you when it comes to states in India it is Andhra Telangana and Kerala these three states together produce 98% of India's palm oil and this particular scheme is going to be implemented in 15 states including the six northeastern states where Arunachal, Assam, Manipur, Mizoram, Nagaland, Tripura are also going to be uh, they are also being selected for growing the oil palms and in fact northeast Indian Andaman regions are the special focus regions of this particular scheme so please remember I'm putting a star mark here do remember Northeast and Andaman Nicobars are they are the specific focus areas 
under the edible oil mission right that is important okay and yeah uh, one more thing in the, for this particular kind of scheme 80 percent share is by central government 20 percent is by state government that's why it is centrally sponsored scheme so normally the ratios are 60 40 but for this program it is 80 20 so you have to be a little bit more careful another question we have on the same kind of uh, topic now you are supposed to figure out the correct one it says india world's second largest importer no we are the largest importer of the edible oil so first it went wrong second is right india is largest importer and consumer of the palm oil yes out of the total oil that we import palm oil is the largest one so here the answer is supposed to be b the question is very easy something you could have attempted very very easily very straightforward question talking about little bit more on the on the factual details right now today india is world's largest importer of the edible oils india produces 44 percent of the edible oil itself but at the same time the rest of the demand india is dependent on the import of the edible oils in fact in the last couple of years if you see in the last 10 years specifically the the kind of imports of india's edible oils they have actually increased in credible amounts where india used to import 11.6 metric ton somewhere in 2013-14 now we are importing 16.5 metric tons in fact india's edible oil impact uh, imports they have risen to almost 1.5 times and become more than double in terms of rupee value so yes india's import is increasing at the same time of the total import of the edible oils that india does the palm oil now this can be an individual standout question as well where you have to you know arrange the number of edible oils as per their import share so palm oil having 56 percent share of the total imports followed by soybean oil 27 and we have the sunflower oil 16 percent so please remember these three not exactly the figures but at least remember the sequence palm oil followed by soya bean followed by the sunflower so at least try to remember the sequence you never know you have a question standalone question on that right okay question number 29 so we have just discussed that the question itself itself says shantilal shah committee we have just discussed this committee is responsible for the formation of medical termination of pregnancy we have just discussed and that's why I, I told you be very careful with all these committees right answer is this it's a straightforward question easy I think everyone must have attempted that because this committee holds a lot of importance we already have discussed so no need to get into the details of this act question number 30 was with respect to the uh, so you are you are giving some pairs so we have the boards and their headquarters okay now here also your basic uh, knowledge of Indian agriculture will come into the play your basic knowledge of agriculture is going to save you in this question like for example if it says rubber board of India where in which state of India we have the maximum rubber production it is clearly not Andhra Pradesh right when you think of rubber you think of Kerala you think of rubber you think of Kerala I'm not going into the detail just trying to make you understand how you can eliminate it right okay when you think of so this clearly is wrong when it when it comes to national jute board you know in the jute production of India is maximum in the state of West Bengal since jute production is restricted or majorly concentrated in the state of West Bengal Kolkata looks probably the appropriate place for the headquarters right similarly you think of coffee you think of Kerala and what better than Bengaluru having the headquarters of the coffee board of India but first statement also looks wrong though the tea board you think of the tea board yes we have Darjeeling and Assam areas Darjeeling is probably the best uh, uh, you know you can think about but of course you can't have the headquarter at a small town tea production is a large business Jalpaigudi is a part of West Bengal but you are going to have the headquarters in a larger space like Kolkata right so first and fourth are wrong with my basic knowledge of agriculture I'm able to get my answer as only two the question was medium level but something I think everyone must have attempted by simply applying the knowledge of agriculture yes so here is the right answer in front of you the tea board is in Kolkata uh, coffee already you have done in Bengaluru okay now some additional points what what if it comes to spice board of India spices you think of spice you think of Kerala right so in Kochi we have the headquarters of spice board for rubber again you have to go to Kerala but which particular place Kotayam in Kotayam you have the rubber board of India 
well in guntur we have the tobacco board because in andhra pradesh the largest amount of tobacco production we are doing uh, uh, in, in in the state of andhra pradesh right you think about the central silk board bangalore is again the place and for the jute board you have the kolkata so do remember them it's it is it is important and i always suggest you to practice the agricultural crops on the map of india it is always advisable so you you have the map in front of you always try to you know uh, you know make the production okay so i am in this particular state uh, like i am in maharashtra there will be jowar i am in kerala there would be rubber i am in andhra there would be uh, this thing called tobacco i'm so like it is always preferable to practice things on the map so that they can stick to your head for longer times right question number 31 is very very uh, tough question tough because it's too specific the question says the gray whales are found in north pacific ocean iucn status is endangered now i would say this was a tough and probably i would have skipped it because it is too specific i mean it is not possible to remember iucn status of everything and it is again like whale is something whale is something which is which which is present in the entire ocean i am not aware about one particular type of whale in which particular part like 90% cases 90% cases these state these kind of statement has some flaw there is something wrong with this i have this gut feeling but i'm not sure which statement is right which statement is wrong and there is very less uh, scope of you know putting your logic into that so i would have skipped it so first let's let's talk about that let's learn about it and then come back so the question is about the gray whales gray whales has many names normal gray whales are also called as gray black whale also called pacific gray whale they are also called the korean gray whales california gray whale there are so many names and these particular whales having a life expectancy of 50 to 55 70 years they are very very special type of uh, whales why they are so special they are the only species of whale having the two blow holes on top of their heads which is uh, from which it it does all the respiration part gray whales are found in the north pacific ocean as the question was asking us right now particularly within that uh, you know whale category there are many kind of whales we have eastern pacific whale within the north pacific we have the eastern pacific we have the western pacific there are there are variety or there are different different varieties right and every variety has a different kind of uh, uh, iucn status like eastern north pacific ones are of least concern the western north pacific ones are of endangered category the north atlantic gray whales are regionally extinct so it, it is difficult for me it is really difficult for uh, to remember all these kind of information so if you have this kind of question better you skip than playing any blind guess on that so yeah but this questions sometimes it comes uh, they are they are meant to make you do some mistakes so be aware of this kind of questions question 32 is with respect to the kisan credit card the kcc now please okay again apply your normal common sense what a kisan credit card would be as the name says kisan credit card means the farmer is going to get some kind of credit it is going to help farmer to get a credit credit in terms of loan right in terms of some loan okay now think about it kcc is the only available for farm activities is it like that no because when i talk about agriculture it is not just the farm activities no along with farm activities there are so many other things included like for example we have all the allied activities included we uh, like recently the kcc was ex was extended even to the fisheries and other allied sectors right so it is not only only for the farm activities this looks too rigid kind of statement and something i would have eliminated as well now 90 95% chances when you have statement like only or something like that so they doesn't uh, they are not always true now look at the second statement now second makes very easy sense it says the kisan credit card covers consumption requirement of the farmer household yes uh, it is going to cover the consumption requirement because when you are going, talking about the credit when you are talking about farmer income of course consumption requirements are being taken care of in this case answer is supposed to be b question is medium but you could have attempted by applying little bit of common sense with respect to the 
Kisan Credits, right? Talking about this scheme in little bit detail, the Kisan Credit scheme was introduced way back in 1988. Okay, right now it is a very effective scheme to provide adequate timely credit support from the banking system to the farmer. I talk, I, I told you it's about getting the loan. So Kisan Credit Cards help the farmers to get the credit, get, get the loan from the formal banking system rather rather they have to go to any some private money lenders they are they are uh, the the whole purpose is to is to connect the farmers through the formal banking system services 2004 this scheme was extended to all allied and even the non farm activities okay and in 2018 19 budget the kcc was also expand, extended to fisheries even to the animal husbandry farmers okay this is important guys and when it comes to implementing agency, who implement KCC? There are multiple agencies. We have commercial banks, we have the regional rural banks, even the small finance banks and the cooperatives. Now this itself is a potential MCQ. So you may be asked that KCC is implemented by which of the following. So yeah, we have these. Uh, and specifically, when you think about the, uh, there are different different kind of credits. We have short term credits, medium term credits. For short term and medium, we have the state cooperatives, we have the central cooperatives and even the PSES at the village level, they also contribute to small and medium terms, okay? And why this particular scheme? This particular scheme gives credit for many things. Under this scheme, the farmer is going to get credit for all these purposes, short term credit requirement for cultivating crops, rearing animals, even aquatic organisms, even the post harvest expenses, producing marketing loan, or you can get the loan for consumption requirement for farmer households, for even for working capitals, investment credit. So there are many categories and consumption requirement is one of those categories that we already have discussed. Getting to the question number 33, which talks about the fair and remunerative price called the FRP. Okay, right now, right now there are two things that you must and must understand when it comes to agriculture in India. Given the kind of situation, given the kind of activities happening around you and given the farmer protest that is being the talk of the town, MSP and FRP, you should be thoroughly clear with these two concepts, very, very important concepts. Now, what is the, now you know about that both are basically the support systems for the farmers, but there's a difference. The MSP, which is minimum support price, MSP is that guarantee by the government where if the prices crashes at below the certain level, the government itself is going to buy, the government is going to buy the agriculture produced directly from the farmer, that is MSP. It is being done for all approximately 22 crops in India. But there is one particular crop, cash crop called sugar cane. For sugar cane, we have very specifically designed FRPs. FRP is specifically for sugar cane, where, where the government is not going to buy government all only fixes the frp the fair remunerative price and it is the task of the sugar mills the sugar mills have to buy the sugar cane from the farmers at a certain pre-decided amount okay so sugar mill has to do the uh, uh, purchasing not the government that is the difference between msp and frp if you look at the first statement it says frp is the minimum price at which sugarcane directly procured from farmers by the union government? No, that is a case of MSP, not the case of FRP. In FRP, the sugar mill has to purchase directly from the farmers and give them FRP at least. So first statement is wrong. Second statement says, right now, any statutory provisions does not govern FRP. It is not the case. For, for, uh, for FRP and M MSP, we have got certain statutory provisions right so in this particular case both statements are wrong and you can very easily figure out that this cannot be the case if you are operating because agri agriculture is the backbone of our country so don't think that there is no there is no there are no rules governing it would be foolish to think like that so here the answer is d uh, this question i would say medium but you could have attempted given the kind of uh, options that you had right now so F FRP, you already know that uh, sugar mills are going to purchase sugar cane from the farmers and FRP always remember is only for the sugar cane. 22 crops has MSP, one crop has FRP. And please remember when it comes to FRP, 
it is governed by some statutory provisions like we have sugarcane control order 1966 which was issued under essential commodity act 1955 so yes there are statutory provisions in india very interestingly frps and msps both are declared by government of india and they are declared by cabinet committee on economic affairs ccea they are declared by them and both of them are recommended by cacp that is commission for agriculture cost and prices so it is the job of cacp to recommend that and implementing announcing part is to be done by ccea cabinet committee economic affair which is chaired by the prime minister of india that is something you have to remember since the both of them are talk of the town you have to be really comfortable with both the topics now next question is with respect to ramsar convention i think this is probably the most easy easy question of your test series because ramsar is something that you must have read 10 20 30 times ramsar is one such topic which is very important and very common in terms of your environmental studies look at the first statement the first statement itself has a big problem you know that ramsar the word ramsar convention is because there is a city of ramsar and ramsar is not in iraq ramsar is a city in iran so 1971 there was a convention that took place in iran city of ramsar and where the world had recognized the wetlands are very important and we need to conserve them we need to put the wetlands to a sustainable use so city cannot be you know you can't uh, uh, make this kind of blunder ramsar is a city in iran not iraq so first straight away is wrong is india part of the convention yes india is a part of ramsar convention you have you are reading about them right now in india there are 80 ramsar sites na right? as of as of uh, march as of march uh, that i'm i'm recording this uh, video march 9 so yes the ramsar india has 80 ramsar sites right now so india is a part of party of that okay one more thing now we celebrate world wetland day now i am asking you a very interesting question when do we celebrate the world wetland day if you know about that please let me know do let me know in the comment section box when do we celebrate the world wetland day that is your task to put that in the comment box well chilka lake is the first wetland of india to be designated ramsar yes it was the chilka only that was the first one and now we have 80 ramsar sites so second and third even the third statement is correct it says the wetland rules india has got exclusive rules in 2017 as per india wetland rules we have excluded the river channels paddy fields human made water bodies tanks specifically for for constructed for uh, drinking purposes they are not considered to be part of wetlands because if if logically if we would have included the paddy fields human made water bodies for drinking purposes as wetlands then we 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 were we were having a compulsion we would have been under compulsion to take care conserve those particular wetlands and that's why deliberately we excluded these kind of things from the wetland definition so that they can be used for human purpose and we are not under any obligation of conserving and stop developing activities around those particular areas right so deliberately in 2017 these areas were excluded otherwise otherwise human settlements would have been suffered a lot so second third fourth looks very much correct the first is not correct now you know the answer it is only three this was a medium one but yes something you could have attempted very very easily overall guys it is important overall uh, just be very careful about one particular thing and that is definition of the wetland why ramsar convention is so important because it clearly defines what exactly should be considered as a wetland and this definition can have the mcq in itself because it specifies the characteristics of a wetland wetland can be any area which is marshy land fen peat land water any such area it can be natural can be artificial matlab man made it can be permanent can be temporary where the water may be static standing or even flowing water can be fresh water brackish water salt water it can be anything but one very interesting point the the depth of the wetland should not be more than 6 so as per ramsar definition 
the depth of the wetland is something should be less than 6 meter at a low uh, tidal depth right that is very interesting right now what you are supposed to prepare like I told you that there are 80 Ramsar sites of course it is good if you if you look at this map this is a map of PMFIS and we have put all the 80 Ramsar sites onto the map but something you have to be even more careful about is the last five the latest five Ramsar sites that we have added on the map of India and here we have mentioned specifically we have mentioned so these are the five like where we have put the uh, these arrows so these are the five latest ones so there are 90 percent chances that you are being asked about the question up from the from the recent editions of the Ramsar site so do read about them and maximum number of times what questions you can expect from the Ramsar sites it is the uh, Ramsar site and the state so be aware about the states from where we have got these sites so it is it they all normal question comes in the form of match of the following kind of thing right question number 35 the question is about marine cloud brightening okay now again I can solve this question now I, I know about the marine cloud brightening normally you must have heard about the term called as cloud seeding I'm sure we all have heard about the artificial clouds that we create something called as cloud seeding so one very interesting basic point that you have to keep in mind before I discuss about anything you must be aware about the term uh, uh, you must be aware of the process how the clouds are formed for for the formation of the clouds there are two basic requirements number one we all know there has to be water vapor because without water vapor clouds cannot be formed but the second very important requirement is the hygroscopic nuclei hygro scopic nuclei hygroscopic nuclei can be anything it can be any type of aerosol can be dust particle can be sea salt can be pollen grain can be any type of thing any aerosol can become hygroscopic nuclei because let's see if there are there are n number of water molecules there are available and they are willing to make a cloud but they can't make a cloud until they have one particular kind of platform where they can attach themselves it is the aerosols that provide them that particular platform where all these uh, you know water vapors can come together and they can stick upon that aerosol and they can form the clouds that is the cloud seeding tech uh, sorry that is a normal uh, cloud formation technique now in certain areas if you are not having enough clouds so this artificially we can uh, make the clouds and if there is there is less amount of water vapor available we spread the water vapor if the clouds are not being formed because there is less amount of aerosols available then in that particular case uh, the aerosols artificially the aerosols are spread and one such technique is one such technique of cloud seeding is called specifically called marine cloud brightening so let's learn about the technique and then we'll come back to the question so this marine cloud brightening MCB it is basically a geoengineering technique that is going to produce brighter and whiter low marine clouds normally in a cloud the cloud is nothing but a collection of lots of water droplets right if the cloud is having large large size water vapors it, it appears to be dark okay it appears to be dark and if the cloud is going to have large uh, like like many small small kind of droplets the size of the droplets is small that that cloud is going to appear more brighter more whiter right now the the word marine cloud brightening says that I am going to produce that kind of clouds which are going to be bright and white and what is the benefit why why we are creating this type of uh, particular kind of clouds number one the very first benefit is it is going to offset it is going to counterbalance the anthropogenic global warming and it is also going to slow the climate change yeah the white and the bright clouds are going to slow down the climate change as well it is also going to reduce the risk of extreme weather events like ha like heat waves or the droughts for that purpose only the marine clouds uh, marine bright clouds are being produced now again very interestingly uh, these clouds these marine bright clouds 
they are going to reflect the sunlight away. What is the difference between a dark cloud and a bright cloud? If it is a dark cloud, it is not going to reflect the sunlight as it should. But if it's a bright and white light, it is going to have more albedo. The word itself is albedo. Albedo is the reflecting capacity of the cloud. If it is going to be more bright, more bright means it is going to have smaller, smaller particles. It is able to reflect more sunlight. Okay. And if, if it is doing so, of course, it is going to reduce the uh, climate effect. At the same time, it is also going to protect the corals. Because uh, like I said, that by uh, introducing the marine bright cloud uh, clouds, we are going to you know hold or we are going to reduce the chances of extreme climatic events and if we are avoiding the climatic events of course we are also going to protect the corals because you know the corals are very sensitive to the climate if there is any kind of climatic change the corals are probably the worst to get get impacted due to climate change because the corals are very sensitive for their habitats right any temperature change in the ocean is going to trigger the bleaching process and that is that's what it comes to into the play now if you look if you look um, at this particular question the first statement is right yes but think about it if we are producing a cloud if we are producing marine cloud ourselves this is our geoengineering product do you think the clouds can be detrimental to corals if that would be the case why we, we would have produced these clouds at the first place so second is logically wrong answer is a the question was a medium one but something you could have risked it because you know about the technique of cloud seeding you know that we can deliberately we can modify the clouds we can make our own clouds depending on our requirements so in this slide if you read whatever i have explained if you read this particular slide you will understand the whole concept of cloud seeding the whole concept how we can uh, we can make and produce these kind of clouds question number 36 is again a very difficult question I mean uh, this was a tough one and I hope and I wish you would not have ended doing any blunder in this question because it is it is asking you to identify a very typical species very typical species and what what exactly species we are talking about is pygmy hog and look at the statements very typical question very difficult one I would say because now if you are if you know about pygmy hog then only you can you can solve it otherwise it's a tough question why what is a pygmy hog by the way this is world's smallest wild pig pygmy hog is world's smallest uh, wild pig and it is one of the indicator species what is an indicator species guys in in ecology ecosystem you must have read these read these terms called indicator species like we have got some keystone species like that no Indicator species are basically those species whose presence indicate the health of that ecosystem. Indicator species actually tells you about the health of the ecosystem of that particular environment. If they are present means the health of the ecosystem is good. That's why they are called indicator species. And pygmy hog is the indicator species of the grassland habitats. Now very interestingly, the, these small pigs they live in a socially family groups they live in a group of uh, like 20 30 uh, pigs together and they are led by matriarch it is the women it's the female uh, pig that leads the whole group it's a very interesting case no uh, overall overall uh, when it comes to the distribution of these uh, uh, pygmy hogs they these these uh, rare pig species are found only in the Manas Wildlife Sanctuary in Assam. So be very careful. There was a time when these pigs used to be found in India, Nepal and Bhutan. But right now they are restricted to Manas Wildlife Sanctuary of Assam. Since their area of habitat has decreased. So that, that makes sense why they are being categorized as endangered. And they are protected under Schedule 1 Wildlife Protection Act Appendix 1 sites. Okay, now if you know all this information then only there is a chance that you could have identified the question in that particular way. Now you know I'm talking about indicator species, I'm talking about a group led by matriarch and only in Mana Sanctuary. So yeah, that qualifies the right answer. But again, this was a tough one. Should have skipped because there is no scope of any uh, anything to, you know, to talk about it. 
okay since we are talking about the manas tiger uh, manas national park you may expect a question coming on the manas national park it's a famous tiger reserves also of our country and it is also one of the unesco natural world heritage site so do read about manas and do read about all important tiger reserves of india and especially those tiger reserves which are in news in the last 18 months at least in the last 18 months whatever national park and tiger reserves are in news do read them about okay do read about them because they're important and upsc is very fond of asking questions talking about the manas national park which is in assam it is actually it is very contiguous uh, with respect to the royal manas national park that is in bhutan so this area is a contiguous area in india it is termed as um, national manas national park in bhutan that extended area is called royal manas national park Manas River which is tributary of Brahmaputra also passes right in the middle of the national park it is important and it is one of the richest area when it comes to biodiversity why the Manas area falls in the Babar Terai region those flood plains of uh, of the of the river and uh, being in the part of Babar Terai region they are they are having rich biodiversity and you have the you have lot of uh, fauna and fauna in that particular area and uh, overall semi evergreen vegetation moist dry deciduous uh, forest even savanna and grasslands are present in that particular uh, area right now you have the question number 37 question 37 is with respect to the harmful algal blooms now whenever you think of the algal bloom whenever you think about harmful algal blooms it is nothing but the case of eutrophication right it is the case of eutrophication you know what a eutrophication is when there is when there is excessive nutrient water coming from the agricultural runoff surface runoff and that additional nutrient water is going to add to any water body it is going to produce lot of algal growth in that area which ultimately is going to kill the the ecosystem right what happens normally if you have this particular uh, water system and due to that additional nutrient rich especially uh, the the runoff that is coming from the fertilizer rich farmlands so all that nutrient excessive nutrient based water when it adds to the water body it is going to produce lots of algal growth on the top of the of the water body and due to that excessive growth of course the sunlight is not able to penetrate deeply into the water that actually kills the dissolved oxygen in the water kills the ecosystem kills the aquatic uh, species under and increases the demand of biological oxygen demand is increased and eutrophication is one particular category which is very harmful for the aquatic systems look at the first statement it's what it says the first statement says the causes of this include high temperatures low turbidity in the water bodies it occurs only in fresh water sources make no sense because we know that eutrophication can be done in any type of water can be fresh water can be uh, brackish or normal water as well right okay now before i discuss the third point you need to know how you need to need to have a little bit idea about the overall thing why i'm talking about hab now you know the, now you know the definition right so whenever the colonies of algae they grow in an uncontrollable manner and those uncontrollable algae is going to produce some toxic harmful effects on people fishes aquatic uh, animals or birds then only we categorize that situation as a harmful algal bloom now we already have mentioned that the basic causes behind the hab can be anything the eutrophication can cause it which is a major reason for the hab where nutrient rich water uh, is going to add to the near water bodies whenever there is a high temperature because high temperature always always favor the growth of the algae and even the low turbidity low turbidity means low turbidity actually enable greater sunlight penetration which is going to further increase the temperature of the of that particular water body even certain cases are there where harmful algal blooms are also triggered by the reversal of the ocean currents it's it's a rare phenomena but if by chance ocean currents are going to get a reversal then also due to any of these reasons the harmful algal blooms can be triggered but again these uh, harmful algal algal blooms it can occur in both the areas can be in marine water can be fresh water when whenever 
we have the uh, uh, harmful algal bloom in the marine waters in marine cases it is basically caused by diatoms and the dinoflagellates they are responsible and in that situation we often call the marine hydro, uh, harmful algal blooms are mainly called as red tides because the color of the water turns reddish brown that's why they are called red tides but that is the case of marine fresh water ha uh, harmful algal blooms are caused by blue green algae where the water turns a little bit greenish which is also called the cyanobacteria so if you look at the statement now you can you can figure out easily my first statement is correct second is wrong and even third statement is wrong because it says fresh water is caused by diatoms and no diatoms and these are going to cause the red red tide and that is the case of the marine uh, hydroalgal uh, harmful algal blooms right the fresh water are caused by blue green algae cyanobacteria so in this case answer is only one uh, i would say this question was a tough one yes it was a tough but i think at least the first two statements you could have done easily third was a bit tough i understand you can't be very sure about if it is fresh water or marine water but at least two can easily be uh, you know you could have solved so yes something you could have risk but now you know the complete information and now you are in a position to solve it if it comes to your exam the next question is again a very typical and difficult question where you are giving given species and you are asked about the iucn status personally many times the chances are you are going to get the answer wrong these questions are tough because if you are not aware about the species or the species is not very much in the news becomes really difficult so please do not take risk in these kind of questions they are not meant to be solved they are meant to be left if you are not aware don't take risk in this case so we have got the three varieties the white bellied sea eagle the crown turtle and the pygmy hawk pygmy hawk we have just uh, solved right so pygmy hawk is clearly not critically endangered they are still endangered so yes one i can rule out straight away now talking about the two the second one is correct the crown river turtle is critically endangered this white bellied sea eagle is not vulnerable it, you if you if you look at the white bellied sea eagles they are still in the category of least concern they they are in the category of least concern i mean this is difficult i understand it is there is no formula there is no logic it is just that if you have read about them then only you can solve talking little bit more about the white bellied sea eagles well we find these kind of eagles in india sri lanka southeast asia and even australia okay and where you find them mostly in the inshore seas or the island coast mangrove estuaries these are the areas where we are likely to find them and right now they are of course they are having some issues because the population is declining because of uh, habitat loss hunting and all that right Uh, but still they are in a better position they are still least concern this is the crown river turtle that you have in front of you it is in critically endangered category when it comes to distribution it is found in central nepal northeast india bangladesh and burma which which is uh, the myanmar pygmy hawk you already have understood along with me so again i am saying this is a typical question something you should not risk if you are not read about this species don't fall into the play of upsc right okay now next question number 39 this question is again something you can solve with the common sense be very careful the question is asking you which statement is not correct okay so it says green credit program and eco mark scheme think about it what what why any program why any credit program is going to be called as green credit normally what can be the green credit so any loan any credit that i am going to take with respect to some kind of eco friendly activity if there is any eco friendly activity i am doing then only i can call it as a green activity right it's a very common word so look at the first statement the green credit program it is a market based mechanism incentives voluntarily it incentivizes voluntary environment action across the diverse sectors yeah look correct because these green credit program is talking about the voluntary environmental actions second is the eco mark or simply called the eco label it says it's a voluntary labeling the word voluntary is very important in india 
maximum things in terms of the eco eco things are done in a voluntary manner they are not done in a compulsory manner right so eco mark is a voluntary labeling on the consumer products meeting indian environmental criteria the word eco eco is eco friendly again eco mark is some kind of uh, activity which is environmental friendly well if you look at the statements they both look correct and actually they both are correct as well so in india right now we have got this green credit mechanism system which is going to incentivize the voluntary environmental activities and it can be done uh, you know anybody individual communities even private sector industries they can get the green credit uh, program right now it this particular program allows individual or entity they can earn the green credits and they can trade it in on dedicated exchanges right right now in in its initial phase these green credit uh, program it is going to focus on two key activities one is water conservation another is afforestation for these two purposes similarly when you when you think about eco mark or eco label so eco labels are administered overall by central pollution control board they are voluntary labeling of of consumer products which are going to meet indian environmental criteria and what is the what is so special about the eco label so overall the central pollution control board is going to administer them along with the bureau of indian standards which you are very well aware this is the sign of bis right we have the isi mark which assures the quality for us and in terms of eco mark eco label now they have chosen this as a mark so there is the ardhan port is the logo of e eco mark that signifies the usage of renewable sources like clay which consume less energy does not do uh, does not create any hazardous waste so that is the that is the label isi is the label of bis and the ardhan port is the label of eco label so next time whenever you buy any consumer product whenever you buy any packed product do look for that there must be this ardhan port label if that is the case then that is that is the eco mark label that we have put right so which statement is not correct both are correct since both are correct and none is incorrect the answer is supposed to be d this question was a again this was a tough question but i think you could have attempted considering the options that are given to you but be careful if you are not sure then there is no need to take unnecessary risk okay last question that we have got last question was with respect to which among the following is not an invasive species in india very tough very difficult very tough question no scope of any kind of uh, guess work i mean i would not have risked it at all these are very difficult questions first of all what is an invasive species at least you know the meaning of invasive species invasive species are those which do not belong to this particular area so there are two areas area a area b and i have got one particular kind of tree let's say in area a it is native to area a but we have introduced that tree in the area b now that particular tree is going to grow so fast in area b that it is going to negatively impact the local vegetation of area b in that particular case this tree is going to be invasive for the local local vegetation of area b right so for that purpose this tree will become invasive species for the area b okay so that is the case now of course there are three options given and but we are because they are very typical names and we have absolutely no idea about them okay but one thing one thing is very important if by chance you are given some normal common names like for example this particular this name lept uh, leptodactylus phallus is actually name of a frog normally invasive species in normal cases invasive species are mostly the vegetations but even yeah even the animals can be invasive for some cases here in this first two are basically vegetation and both are invasive species so but we are supposed to figure out which is not invasive answer is supposed to be a which is uh, three only tough question i would not risk it because the options are difficult and something which are not common just to add to your knowledge let me explain you little bit about these invasive species now you know the concept so the first one was given as lantana camara this is invasive species in india because this actually belongs natively it belongs to central and south america 
it was the britishers who introduced this crop as an ornamental plant in india and right now it is it is very very it, it has become toxic for the livestock they can, this plant can actually damage the liver uh, of the of the livestock and that's why they have become invasive in india similarly you have another uh, uh, you know plant called as the micania micrantha this is another invasive species is species in india uh, which is also called as bitter vine so this also belongs to the north central and south america it was again introduced in india uh, it was actually introduced as a tea plantation ground cover in 1940s by britishers but right now it has become a threat for the plantation crops and the forest nation wide and now right now this is one of the invasive species of india which is not giving us the right thing the third was actually a frog this frog which is which uh, whose name is given as leptodactylus phallus actually commonly known as mountain chicken frog now this belongs to caribbean islands of dominica right now it is found in most of the habitats of the rainforest it is critically endangered but it is not a invasive species yet as of now it is not an invasive species so just skip that kind of question very difficult i hope you have learned a lot of things from this particular video i hope you have enjoyed and learned a lot from our discussion guys if you if you really enjoyed the thorough uh, video please do uh, like our video and let me know your feedback in the comment section box and do not forget to check out the link of the test series so i'll see you guys uh, in the next video where i'll be discussing the next 20 questions all my best wishes for your upcoming exams signing off thank you so much god bless you take care जय हिंद